There we go. Welcome to Mondays at Noon, everyone. I'm Dr. Molly Pepper. I'm the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs here in the School of Business. And Mondays at Noon is our weekly program where we gather as a community to talk about issues that are important to us. And we are recording this session. It will be available later on our YouTube channel. So this week we have a special program of careers in economics. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Ryan Herzog, who is going to be the MC for the event. So, Ryan. Well, thank you, Molly. So, welcome. Looks like we're getting a pretty good turnout, um, which is good to hear, good to see. Um, so, I want to first just welcome everyone um, on the Careers in Economics. This is our first one. Um, hopefully, we can do more uh, down the road where we actually get these people to campus. Um, I know they've all been back to campus at some point, um, and so it'd be great to get everyone together. So I'll go through and, and just kind of start and, and do a basic introduction of who they are, and then um, I'll kind of turn it over to them after I do the introduction one by one to tell me a little bit about their job, their company, so you can kind of understand what it is they're doing. And then we'll do um, a few more questions. And, and largely, um, I would encourage anyone to, if you have questions specifically for the panelists to, to throw it in the chat, chat them, ask them, um, but ask questions, right? Because this is a chance for you guys to learn a bit about what it is economics students, graduates do. Um, so I'll start the first person I'll introduce because it's first on my list is Jocelyn Clues. Jocelyn Clues is the director of product analysis at Liberty Mutual. She'll talk all about what that does and what she does in her job here in a second, but she is a 2014 graduate at Gonzaga. Uh, she actually has a bachelor's of science in economics and I think a financial, uh, an, uh, a financial analytics minor, if I remember right from advising her. Yep. Um, perfect, perfect. And so next is Nicole Pancello. Did I pronounce it right? Sweet, it's only taken me about 10 years. She is the institutional relationship manager at Vanguard Investments. She also has an economics degree, graduated in 2014. So welcome, Nicole. Um, next on the list is Ben Furman. He's the one we're going to turn to for the all the all, all the wisdom. Is he's the longest graduate. He's celebrated his ten year graduation this year. Uh, he is a commercial real estate relationship manager at Columbia Bank. Uh, he has a BBA in both economics with concentrations in economics and finance. Two thousand ten graduate. And the last one on the list is Agnes. Zajac, is that how I pronounce it? Did I mispronounce it, Agnes? Zajac. Zajac. It changed on me when she got married. She is a pricing manager at Alaska Airlines. Um, she is a 2013 graduate, also um, bachelor's of business administration degree with concentrations in economics and finance. So with that said, I will first, first question I'll ask for all four of the panelists and I'll start with Jocelyn, just kind of go in that order is tell me about your job, company, what it is you do, how, how does the economics degree uh, help you? So Jocelyn, yeah. go for it. Sounds good. So I'm actually going to start with a little bit of a background with Liberty Mutual Insurance because I, when I was sitting in your shoes, I never thought that I'd start working in insurance and it turns out it's a lot more interesting than it sounds. And so first and foremost, so I work for Liberty Mutual Insurance. It's one of the largest property and casualty insurers in the United States. It has been around for over 100 years based in Boston, Massachusetts, but there it's number 77 on the Fortune 100 list. We have more than 45,000 employees and that's not based on the just in the United States. They're actually globally. We have operations internationally and as of late been recognized recognized as the best place to work for women, for diversity, and as well as for ph philanthropic dedication. And so really great place. I've been there for going on seven years now. And just to kind of talk about my career, as well as my specific role right now. So I started in a development program that was analytics focused, and it was rotational in nature about a year. And so you got to work in some of the different ancillary functions on a rotation basis. And what that means is doing analytical projects and all of the different facets of the business. So it could be anything from distribution. So how do we sell insurance? claims. How do you actually process a claim when somebody needs their insurance? As well as how do we decide what we're actually going to offer. And insurance is a unique product in that you're not offering a regular commodity. You're offering a promise to somebody that on their worst day, 
we're going to show up with a check. And so what my team is specifically responsible for now is managing our auto and property insurance at a state level. We work with the regulatory bodies of um, the Department of Insurance to decide what we can and cannot do and how we're going to do best by our customers. And I have a team of four people that are responsible for the profitability and loss of our insurance products in the entire Pacific and Northwest. And so some of their projects could vary from strategic in nature to really analytical or technical and thinking about, for instance, as of late, looking at the West Coast, we've had an unprecedented year of wildfires. And so how are we going to mitigate that in the future? So 10 years from now, we can still commit to that promise to our customers. And so that's what my team's responsible is for, for is figuring out how do we predict the future, price insurance, uh, also what can and can we not offer, thinking about right now, especially with all of us being from home and calling into this, thinking about with COVID, is that something that we could even insure against in the future? And so those are the, some of the problems that we solve. Perfect. Awesome. And so you, you definitely, for the people listening in, heard you've been in economics class, pricing, forecasting, you'll hear some buzzwords that I think will tie into a little bit about what you're hopefully learning in, in your curriculum. So now next I will turn to Nicole and let her tell us a little bit about her job and company at Vanguard. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, everyone. Hi to all my old professors. Um, I made it out of college. <laughs> um, I hope everybody's doing great. My name is Nicole Panicello. Uh, my current job is a relationship manager at Vanguard. And what that means, well, first of all, Vanguard, it's a um, investment company. We do everything from mutual funds, ETFs. We help companies manage their 401ks and we help with providing advice to individual investors. So my job as a relationship manager is business to business. I'm supporting companies with assets from 150 to about 500 million at Vanguard and making sure that their 401k, which is their retirement plan, is running smoothly. Something else that is really important within my job is using tools, resources, data to push my clients to adopt best practices and really influence and persuade them to bring more money to Vanguard by helping their retirement plan be stronger and helping their, um, their participants, which is anybody in a 401k, uh, closer to retirement themselves. Uh, again, same same sort of story. You're one of the one of the things I think will come out with all four of these uh, panelists is you'll hear a lot of reference to economics, but you'll also hear a lot of reference to marketing, to finance, a lot of cross disciplinary work. So good, thanks, Nicole. And next is is Ben Furman to talk to us a little bit about his role and with Columbia Bank. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Ryan. I did graduate in 2011, so I'm not quite that old, um, but I definitely am feeling the more senior member, which is kind of crazy to say, of the panelists. Um, I've actually been with Columbia Bank since 2011. Um, I came out in also not a fantastic job market at that time, so uh, it was pretty interesting to kind of go through the iterations. It took me four or five months to get a job right out of college, um, so it was definitely a process. Uh, but uh, with Columbia Bank, I started in there. It's a different, uh, it's called private banking, um, which was like more high net worth um, doing credit an analysis work. Um, and um, I've managed to pivot three times within Columbia Bank. Um, also worked, uh, they have a trust company where I was doing um, some investment management work for them, uh, trading uh, client funds and whatnot, and then managing all of their uh, trust owned real estate. So did that for three or four years and then have moved into the financing of commercial real estate. So Columbia Bank separates out the uh, investor owned commercial real estate. So anything with non um, owner occupied. So your apartment complexes, your, uh, you know, commercial buildings that are leased to medical office or, or those kind of things. Um, and we do loans from anywhere up to about 25 to $30 million. Um, and so, my job is to source those loans and then get them through the, the approval channels and, and get the funding done and out the door. Um, and so I, my role is actually more of a sales role um, currently. Uh, it, it, I started in the, in the underwriting side and have kind of moved into the, the sales management side. So um, as far as how economics is used, Columbia Bank, we're a regional bank. 
um, we're headquartered in Tacoma, but we are in all over uh, the, the Northwest, really. <clears throat> Offices in Portland, Seattle, uh, Bellevue. And then we actually, um, we have a couple offices over in Spokane. And, uh, you know, we actually have a Northern Idaho presence because we had purchased a bank over there. So realistically, we cover the Northwest footprint. And, um, you know, mine is specific to real estate, but just commercial banking in general covers every industry. Every industry that needs banking has different, um, you know, underlying aspects to what you have to understand from a risk perspective when you're lending and also an opportunistic perspective when you're trying to gather deposits and services that help those different industries. So, um, you know, real estate is the most basic supply and demand uh, market there possibly is. Um, so, you know, that's what that's micro it's microeconomics through and through. So uh, pretty interesting. Good, good. Thanks, Ben. Um, and then last and, and potentially probably the most interesting position uh, during the coronavirus pandemic is Ana Zajac, who does manager of pricing at Alaska Airlines. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having um, me today. I've been with Alaska for about seven and a half years since I graduated. Um, this certainly has been the most interesting year. <laughs> um, I've seen some interesting stuff. I've seen us buy another airline. I've seen us do really cool stuff. And this has just been an insanely crazy year for us. Um, but we've, you know, amidst a lot of layoffs that we've had at the company, my department's the one to actually lose the least number of people. Um, I actually lost one of my team due to retirement and not a layoff. And that's because um, our jobs are critical to keeping the airline running and profitable. Um, so I actually started out as an inventory analyst. Um, that role was all about forecasting future demand. Um, so inventory analysts essentially determine how many seats we want to sell at um, different price points. Um, and then I moved over to an ancillary role um, where I was managing um, how we um, integrated our fees and policies with Virgin America when we acquired that airline. Um, and so we had to basically decide how do we want to appear um, as a blended company, um, how do we want to compete against other airlines? And then from there, I moved over to our pricing team. So I've hopped around a lot within um, the revenue management department. And within pricing, my team decides what price points we actually want to offer in the marketplace, what fares we want to file. Um, so my analysts decide strategies that they want to have on different routes, how we want to compete against different airlines. Um, and then we make sure we're either competitive or if we're not, it's for very good strategic reasons where we have a competitive advantage. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely love what I do. It is econ down to, you know, our, our fundamentals, our department is literally built on economics. Um, I also studied a lot of um, accounting when I started off at Gonzaga. Then I decided with some influence from Ryan and Kevin, <laughs> um, I decided to move over, move over to econ. Um, I wasn't sure exactly how I'd use my degree. So I also um, concentrated in finance as kind of a backup option if I didn't find an, a degree in or a job exactly in the econ field. Um, and so I will say it's kind of nice to have a diversified education um, because as I've hopped around different roles and as I'm looking at future um, you know, opportunities, it definitely helps to have kind of a variety of skills in my pocket. Perfect, thank you. Um, so before I get into the next question, um, I'm just going to see if any students want to chime in. If they have any questions um, that are that they they're dying to ask, uh, please just give you a second to unmute and ask. And if not, I'll get to the next question. I think we're going to have a lot of shy students. Um, okay, so I'll start this actually back with Agnes. Um, what? kind of tying these two questions together, what skills classes did you find the most useful when you started your job? And then what has enabled you or what skills have you found more important five, six, seven years into the job? That's a really good question. So when I started, um, and again, I'm in a department that's built on the concept of like supply and demand. So when I started, I mean, I lived and breathed what I learned in econ. Um, forecasting demand is literally about figuring out how many seats we have to sell, how many customers are out there looking. We have to make sure we're timing things right. Um, if we sell out too early on any given flight, that means we're turning away customers that could have paid $1,000 on the day of travel. Um, and so, you know, we might rather have one traveler like that than five travelers paying $100 each. So that, I mean, from day one was um, super important. I think honestly, my degree in economics or my concentration in economics is what ended up um, landing me the job. 
Um, now, as I moved um, onward to ancillary, uh, to manager of ancillary revenue and now to manager of pricing, I will say that um, showing soft skills has probably been more important. So initially, you know, you show you can do the job well. Um, for me, my, again, micro macroeconomics, like those two courses are just fundamentals. Um, even econometrics like that has really applied in my life. You know, when we're buying a house and we're looking at, you know, is it worth buying a house with an extra bedroom or with an extra bathroom? Um, that has, you know, shown up kind of, you know, in regular life outside of work. But as I've grown within Alaska, um, soft skills, especially communication, the ability to interpret a lot of heavy data and communicate it to senior management who might only have a couple minutes to listen to you, that's been super important. And I think where, um, where Gonzaga helped me a ton was, you know, with the research projects we did, with the presentations we did, figuring out how to take a 20 slide deck and condense it into two, three slides. Sometimes at work, it seemed impossible, but at the end of the day, that's kind of how, um, how I've been able to grow and, um, and just show that I'm able to interpret a lot of heavy data um, and summarize it in a way where our executives are not in the day-to-day -day numbers, right? They need kind of the higher level, um, big, big data to, um, to understand what's going on in the business. So that's good because we're hearing a lot of big data, data ana analytics, and then this other piece of communicating, right? And that's one of the things that Gonzaga as a business school has really started to push is more analytics in the curriculum. Um, we've sort of embedded it throughout every concentration. Um, we're, we're looking at developing programs and analytics because it seems like at, an, at a least to get that entry level role, analytics is becoming critical. So awesome, good. Ben, you go. Yeah, so I'm, um, you know, a couple of things just to add on. I think uh, embedding stats and analytics is really key because it actually flows through into jobs you may not even think are, you know, would be heavy, heavy in the analytics. It's just a, it's a way that you can really stand out if you can understand, um, you know, what sort of marketing efforts and whatnot you can drive from data. But I mean, the, the foundation in bedrock is still micro and macroeconomics. I mean, you see it play through in every, every single thing, even decision making that you make on a personal level um, in your career. And one of the things, uh, you know, I would, I would try and, you know, pass along is that developing the soft skills early is really important. Um, your ability to write and communicate um, to your team members is really how they almost kind of judge your, your technical skills sometimes too. So if, if you can be really good at something but not know how to like communicate it effectively or be even too timid to bring it up in meetings or those kind of things, it just, it, it's not gonna, you know, make you stand out at all early in the career. And if you're trying to advance in a, in a company or just gain exposure to different um, things, I mean, you have to be willing to, to take those steps, so. Good, so I mean, I think we're, we're kind of getting a, a continual message here. Um, kind of the, the analytical skills are important. And then that next piece though of, of learning how to communicate them, right? Um, without that communication piece is, is where you're going to struggle to move up, right? Um, Nicole over at Vanguard, what's your take on courses, skills that were very vital for you starting, but what you found now leaning on more? So um, in my current role, it's very people fo focused. I work with analysts all the time and they're doing a lot of the data crunching and um, analytical work that I don't necessarily do, but I have to present to my clients. Um, I would say one of the most influential, influential classes for me was um, work wages and inequality. I don't know if that's still a class, but it was actually um, super helpful in thinking about decision making. So a lot of times when I'm trying to push my client towards a decision, trying them to, um, you know, do something positive for their employees that might cost them a couple hundred thousand dollars a year or maybe a million dollars a year. It's something that I try and approach from an economic standpoint. So seeing not only like how could this affect those who are lower earners or higher earners, but how can I talk to somebody who's at a CEO, CFO, head of HR level in a way that will resonate to the, both them and for the people that they maybe represent at other parts of the company. So I would say being able to look at data and understand what it's saying, but then also being able to paint a story of why it's important is the most important part of my job. So um, work wages and equality, 
just macro and, and micro. <laughs> and then um, also just having the degree from Gonzaga adds a lot of credibility to my clients. They see econ, they see Gonzaga and they automatically are like, okay, she probably has an idea of what she's talking about. So whatever you end up doing, there is a lot of um, just great vibes around Gonzaga and people have a really good impression of you without you having met them already. How much did Kevin pay you to say that? <laughs> I don't think anything, right, Kevin? <laughs> he is yeah, in here. Uh, is he going to chime in? He probably won't chime in. So we can talk about him. No, I'm just giving him a hard time. Um, no, and, and students do love that work wages and equality course. And I think this is a plug that there's a lot of these applied micro courses, whether you're looking at more of the finance careers or uh, more of the healthcare environmental careers, where it's the same skill set, right? It's, it's how do you take data? And how do you make informed decisions based off of that data? So I think that's consistent with a lot of those courses. And, and last on this question, Jocelyn, do you have anything to add? I would oh. echo everything that everybody's already said, but the things that I would add are the things that are most important for me now were also important for me at the beginning and it's project management, curiosity, and communication. And the first two really where it comes into play is, especially in the professional realm and probably within some of your coursework already, there isn't always a right answer. It's just building a business, a really compelling business case that you can influence other people to get behind. And so when it comes to coursework, the things that were most valuable for me right out of school, but even more so now in retrospect, where a lot of those more robust open-ended papers that you had to complete. So whether that was macro econ or some of your electives, like taking that incredibly seriously and thinking about how do I build some sort of business case? But from a project management perspective also, it's thinking about how do I control and manage the scope of this? Because you can get a lot of scope creep. So making sure that you're spending time where you can have the most impact. And the last thing that I wanted to add kind of in the communication space and to bring in what Nicole said of telling a story, with the first step of any kind of analytical task, it's making sure you know how to do the data, perform the analysis, and that gives you insight. But to have the most impact, you have to use that insight and translate it into action and be able to effectively communicate that to decision makers. Good. And so I think my next question for, for all of you, and we'll work going the reverse now and start with Jocelyn, so I'll keep it on her for right now. Um, Given everything in terms of what's going on today on the job market, we heard Ben mention how he entered the job market in 2011. And, and trust me, I, I know how painful that job market was for you guys. Um, and, and I know most of you are in, are in or have been in hiring positions. What should students be doing to be more competitive for an internship? And then when they get that internship, what is the expectation of students to, when they start? Because it's, it's changed. Really good question. So what can you do today and right now? The biggest thing I would say is be informed and educate yourself on what are hiring teams looking for from a skill set perspective within the application itself. So usually they'll have a job posting and they'll talk about required experience or skills. Really look at those skills, especially for entry level positions. It's probably going to lean a little bit more technical and knowing the, the talent that is attracted at Gonzaga, I know that there's one, a lot of opportunities, two, a lot of resources, and three, a lot of those two things together with it in combination with your network to get you like the education equipped to be prepared for some, a lot of those roles. So maybe you see something and it's like, I need this type of programming experience. Don't be reluctant to pursue a computer science course. If that's something that you think would help you and it's a application that you're really excited about just kind of being able to tell that story of like how you're building those skills for yourself um, that's what i would say for the front end of like how to get your shoe in the door but then second coupling that with say you're on your first day what's different and what's changed being remote it's easy to just be behind your computer all day. You're not sitting side by side with somebody in the office. And sometimes it's easier to be a little bit more reserved and reluctant to ask questions, but don't feel that way, especially being remote. You should be asking more questions, building your network, reaching out to people. And at least to speak for Liberty and I'm sure for everybody else on the panel, there's a lot of really collaborative and work environments that are based in community and we're better by asking those questions and bringing each other up. 
Perfect. I was responding to a couple of questions on chat. So, um, and, and this is going to reiterate, I think, some things that I tell our students, um, even our freshmen and sophomores, go to career fairs. Totally. And find companies that you're interested in. And you might not be ready for an internship, but if you meet a company that you like and you see jobs that you're interested in, talk to them and, and, and ask them what to do, right? Because totally. it's going to help inform that information down the road. So good. Um, Nicole. Those are really good points, Jocelyn. Um, I would echo what she said, but also um, don't be willing, don't be afraid to put yourself out there on LinkedIn. Um, if you just search the name of the company plus the recruiter, a lot of times you can find recruiters for some of the companies that you maybe are most interested in. Um, I started on in a phone based role. I was a call center employee when I first started at Vanguard. And if you would have told me like, yeah, great, that's going to be your dream job after you get out of school, I would have been like, no, that's, that's insane. I never would want to do that. But it got my foot in the door. And now I've been able to stay at Vanguard for five years and I've made a really good career out of it. And I'm in a position that I would consider a dream job. So it does take some time. It does take some work by putting yourself out there and maybe being willing to take something that might not be your first choice at the beginning, but you can see a long-term career path. Um, in terms of other things um, of when you should expect to, you know, when you should start and like what you can be doing when you start at a new company virtually, I would say number one, be willing to build relationships uh, via video conference, chat. You're really going to be as strong as your network is across the company. So think about ways where you can start to meet other people, um, start to add value to different types of different parts of the business so people can get to know you and really advocate for your own work. And secondly, be your own advocate. It's really hard to be able to see how someone's doing and see exactly, you know, if they're getting A's or B's when you're in work, the work environment. So a lot of times if you have any kind of professional success or if there's something that you're really working on being better at, a lot of times it's going to be up to you to do that. So bringing it to the attention of your manager or a mentor um, is really key when you're working virtually. Um, so just, I, I'm getting a couple of questions in the chat that I'll have Nicole answer and then have Agnes kind of follow up on. And if Jocelyn, we'll come back to you after we get through Ben, but, um, or Ben's next, sorry. So one question was, um, when you're going through this kind of question, um, how many of you guys have to travel for work and oh, pre COVID, right? Um, I, Ben, do you travel much? Yeah. Um, Nicole does. Agnes just travels cause she can. Is that fair? For work too. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do, but but one of the perks of Alaska is travel. <laughs> travel. So uh, I, I definitely know she does some travel there, um, and so that was one of the questions. And then um, in in looking at this question uh, to, to Ben, um, I think I know the answer to this, but and maybe um, I think only one of you maybe this is the case. But um, how many of your job? How many of you started your job after an internship with the company? I think it's just Jocelyn, right? I didn't have an internship. You didn't. So, mm -mm. okay. You're the reason why we have now so many interns going to Liberty Mutual. Probably. <laughs> um, so that, that I totally forgot about that. So, okay. None of them, none of them uh, started with an internship. Now, is that changing? I mean, I can answer for our company. Yes, that's definitely changing. Um, we've actually built out more of an internship program and we hired someone out of an internship program very recently. Um, and the goal, I guess, with, and it's more of a company driven thing is it's the holistic idea within the company. So they come in and they'll go through three or four different business lines um, and meet different teams. And to answer the question you were posing before of what you can do when you started a company, you should almost treat it a little bit like an internship when you are initially joining, because what you're, what you need to do is you need to build like a, an understanding of the whole operations of, of a company to understand how your role fits better in there. And in meeting all those people, that's how you're going to get the further opportunity within said company as someone who has gone to three different departments within my same, uh, you know, umbrella and done three completely different things. Right. So you, you want to, to build relationships, not only with your team, but with, you know, the ancillary teams that also, you know, you work with. That being said, obviously being realistic, it's, it's a challenging environment right now that none of us have truly gone through before. So we can only give advice that, that works in a, you know, in a, in a, in, in a 
I guess it works in person, but it can also work um, virtually. It just is, it takes a little bit more effort, to be honest. Um, you have to be more proactive about scheduling those things. And, and I think that's as far as like what you can do to try and, you know, get some more experience on your um, resume. Uh, you know, it still comes down to networking a lot of times. And if you have a soft, um, you know, person that is giving your resume into the hiring manager or whatnot, it goes a thousand times further. Um, we pretty much have only hired people that come in with some sort of recommendation from the outside. Um, and that is just, it's not, you know, any sort of policy. It's just when you know, when you have someone recommending your skill set, you have a little bit more faith in, in said skill set. Uh, so reach out to uh, your alumni network. I mean, you know, we're all, we're in your shoes, I guess, supposedly not too long ago, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's, we understand what it's like to try and, you know, get out and build a network, especially if you're moving to an area that you're not, you didn't grow up, up in, or you didn't go to school in, right? So use the network that's there. Um, you know, I mean, that's just, it, 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 you gotta, you gotta play the cards that are dealt to you on that one. So. And I'll add in that network includes your professors, because I am certain all of these four have emailed us at some point saying, hey, we have a job opening. Do you know any students? Right. And so I would advocate that in that network, yes, it's the GU alum group, but it, it's also us because we do have this connection with with these graduates that are in the hiring positions and that are can, can give you that recommendation. Agnes, let's get you your, your thoughts on this last and we'll move to. Oh, you muted yourself. I muted myself at the last minute. Go for it. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I think everybody's made a lot of good points. What I would add is, um, you know, if you know exactly the type of role you want to get, you might have more flexibility by being able to go to lots of different companies and apply, you know, across many industries. Like if you know you want to be a financial analyst, virtually every company out there has that kind of a role. So if you're in that kind of a position, great. Um, what we see a lot of the time at Alaska is people want to work for Alaska Airlines specifically. And so sometimes we have folks that end up, you know, their first job, their kind of foot in the door isn't necessarily their dream job. Um, but what usually ends up happening is folks end up loving the job, you know, after some time in it anyways. And so that's kind of what happened to me. And I kind of heard maybe a few months after I started, if you make it two years at an airline, you'll probably be an airline person for life. And now I'm totally drinking the Kool-Aid. I've thought many different times about leaving, but it's true. Like once you find a company you really love and um, are loyal to, um, it's just, it fuels, it gives you a lot of passion for many different departments. It fuels your growth. You're able to kind of move around and try different things. Having solid relationships, whether it's, you know, right now at school with your professors, with your network, and then, you know, at work, it's just super critical. Um, building, you know, a good reputation for yourself, um, it's just, again, it's super important. Um, I think Nicole said, you know, be your own advocate. You know, I've always been somebody that hasn't expected others to propel me forward. I've kind of always taken initiative um, and asked for meetings that maybe, um, you know, it didn't feel natural to ask for, but eventually like those were the types of initiatives that helped move me forward. Um, and I think the last thing I'd add is I applied, um, I wasn't in the same shoes as Ben. 2013 was not the same market as 2011. Um, but I applied for almost 100 jobs. And for half of them, I got automatic replies saying, no, thanks, we're not interested within the first five minutes. Um, and so just don't give up. Know that, you know, you're going to end up wherever you need to be. Um, it certainly can be discouraging at times. But, um, but again, 100 jobs. And I eventually ended up finding something that I had no idea I'd be passionate about. So I, I do remember a few office visits. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, with Agnes and I do remember an email I think 18 months after you got the job like I'm not sure if this is what I want to do and and I think I, I think you are happy with where you are mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think this is the point of, of you you're going to want to make the most of it right like in this environment it changed 180 from what we saw maybe a year ago where students had multiple positions multiple offers to where now um that's not maybe going to be the case and it's going to be harder and harder. And so it's learning to take what you're given and make the most of it. Um, the story of, of you guys is funny because I did have a student who wanted a job at Liberty Mutual. He'd interviewed 
in a department at Liberty Mutual. And he literally told the recruiter, well, this isn't really my dream job, but I know it's a foot in the door. And I'm like, oh, so advice, right? It may not be your dream job. Don't ever say that in an interview, please don't. Um, and so we just, I, I did advise the student on that. So um, it was pretty, pretty entertaining. So kind of last question I have, and I want students, I want you guys thinking about things. Um, given this environment, if you could go back um, and, and, and tell yourself one thing to do differently, what would you have done differently? Maybe it's take a different course, do, let's not say a different major, but <laughs> what would you have done differently uh, to your 21 year old self to, to get ready? So we'll start with Agnes and work back. Karma, Ryan. <laughs> I don't know if this is very good advice or not, but for me, the first couple years, um, I, I was always somebody that, you know, took a lot of initiative and was really concerned with my future and always wanted to make sure I was doing the, the best next thing I could do. But I really obsessed with what I was going to major in my first two years. And so I think those are some of the office visits Ryan's referring to. Um, initially, I started out as an accounting major, and then I was nervous that because I wasn't loving those classes, you know, I, I was trying to set myself up for a future that I wouldn't love. And at the end of the day, I think if you're in the business school, um, it doesn't, I mean, it, it certainly matters what you're, you know, what you're studying, but it doesn't have to be exactly where you end up. You know, in the last couple of years, I've considered roles in marketing and in sales, and that's not exactly what I studied, you know, not directly what I studied. Um, and that doesn't mean that I can't, you know, that completely change the course of my career right now. So um, I'm, again, I'm kind of glad I obsessed over the things I did because it always motivated me. And, you know, I always was making sure that I was doing the best I could do, but I would just not freak yourselves out maybe as much as I did because, you know, it's, it's a huge sea out there. Like there are plenty of careers, there are plenty of great companies. Um, the analytics um, jobs, the analytics job market is just growing with the way that, you know, technology, artificial intelligence is, is booming. Um, the analytical jobs I had when I started at Alaska basically don't exist anymore because computers have already replaced them. And now analyst roles are completely different and they're guiding the automation. So, um, yeah, everything just changes very quickly. And so be flexible and don't obsess over what's going on right now. Um, that's that's good advice. Ben, go for it. Yeah, um, actually, you know, that's, that's fantastic advice. I would focus uh, more so I'd go back and probably take a couple of either not uh, philosophy, but like uh, psychology or like personal growth classes that are because uh, the more aware you are of your strengths and weaknesses, um, the better you are when you are in a, in a stressful environment, um, especially in an interview environment. Everybody asks that question, what are your strengths and weaknesses? And most people do not answer that well. Um, you, you really should actually understand where you're, you know, if you really hate conflict, know that you really hate conflict and know a good way of addressing that in a work environment. Um, you know, the, the, the big thing is that with data automating all these jobs, right? The jobs that can't be automated are the ones that require human to human interaction and contact, right? So that should be a skill set that you you are working towards developing. And it is it is a developable skill set. So I would just say, you know, take some time to truly understand, you know, your strengths and weaknesses on a communication and interpersonal level, right? Because that's going to come up a lot in a stressful work environment. I think that's really good advice because I think we all know that question is coming and we don't know how to answer it. So I think focusing on, on those areas where you do struggle and coming up with remedies. Yeah, don't say you're too driven. That's just, it's never, it's just not a good answer. Like, I I'm mean, too much of a perfectionist. Is yeah, that not I just, <laughs> it just, I mean, if, if you're going to take that route of do the positive, right, um, a positive weakness, at least have a, you know, don't just go with, I'm too good at what I do. Like that just doesn't, <laughs> like it doesn't come across well in an interview setting. Especially when you're 22 and you don't even know what it is we're really doing yet, right? Yeah, exactly. So anyway, <laughs> just, cause it's gonna come. That question I almost guarantee you is, is going to be in every, um, you know, interview. Also, this may seem very obvious, but know a lot about the company you are interviewing for. Um, you know, 
the word, one of the other bad things you can do is just not know anything about the company. Um, like if you ask, you know, what do we do? And you can't explain that. That's a, that's a very bad look. So. And I will add to that. Even when we hire new candidates at Gonzaga, we'll get 200 applications for one position and 150 of them won't mention Gonzaga anywhere on the cover letter other than the address. Right. And, and Agnes, you heard her talk about applying to a hundred different positions. Right. When you are, you have to customize it. You have to take that extra step and know the company you're applying for. So I think that's good advice. Uh, Nicole. Uh, good points, Ben and Agnes. I would say um, a couple things. If I had gone back in time, I probably wouldn't be as shy with my accomplishments. I felt like when I first got into the workplace and I was applying for jobs, I was really timid about what I was doing. I didn't feel confident in like my skills. I was kind of like, well, hopefully they'll hire me. I, I'm not that qualified, but instead shifting my mindset, I think has really helped my career. And I would encourage you guys as students to start shifting even before you get into the workplace and thinking about how you can add value from day one, rather than thinking about like, oh no, am I gonna be perfect? Am I gonna do this? Just whatever, don't, don't worry about that too much. Um, other things I would have done if I could go back is stop messing with other majors and just do econ. <laughs> I thought <laughs> going through school that if I had like three majors, I would be like the best candidate ever for a job. But honestly, in all my interviews, every single interviewer was like, whoa, you majored in econ. That's really cool. Like, wow, what was that like? It already has like an allure because it, it can go towards anything. If I wanted to go into working for I don't know, like a film studio, I could do that. Or I could go work for a marketing company. Econ is super versatile. And I wish that I had realized that sooner than junior year. So I wouldn't have taken all these other classes before. So if you're a freshman, um, just really consider what you're, where you're spending your resources in terms of time. And then other things I would have done is use a career center more. A lot of times I felt like I was kind of alone in, in my application process. Like I went to these webinars, but I didn't really use all the resources that I had available within the career center or with my professors. And I wish I had used that more. And then the last thing is I wish I'd gotten more um, involved extracurricularly, if extracurricularly at, Van, at Gonzaga. It's always a really great way to have a conversation starter um, and talking about your passions within an interview. So I wish I had done a little bit more of that while I was um, at Gonzaga as well. So I can I interject the question from the call? So you're, you're uh -oh, saying international uh -oh. studies wasn't a big help? What? I'm sorry. Are you saying that international studies wasn't a big help? <laughs> no. No, I look back and I'm like, what was I doing, man? I'm like, I don't remember. So anyways. What, was, what was your third? You said you had three? I don't even know how many I had. I had a lot of majors at Gonzaga, but at the end of the day, just know that life is really long. You can change your career path. You don't have to do one thing forever. And just because you major in one thing doesn't mean it doesn't really mean that much at the end of the day. You graduated, you graduated from a great school and hopefully you got pretty good grades. That's it. <laughs> well, I think that, I think the, the point I'll emphasize is, and this is really, um, I think valuable for students so many students are, hey, I have extra courses. What concentration can I add? What concentration can I add? What concentration can I add? And they end up with like four concentrations. And then you ask them, well, what are you interested in? I don't know, right? They still haven't figured out that, that answer, right? And maybe that's good that they've gone out and experimented, but take classes that are interesting to you and not focus so much on fulfilling a degree worksheet, right? Make sure you get your major done in four years right, economics. And then if a class, if you're, if you're not sure what you wanna do, take a class here and there, don't focus on, oh, I can get this minor and this minor. Well, why do you want that minor? I don't know, because I can, right? Like have more intent. Okay, Jocelyn. That would have been my advice to myself. So thank you. <laughs> no, but hindsight, I think about just trying to check boxes of like the degree or the experience, but thinking more about like, what do I want to get out of the coursework itself? What is interesting to me? What is going to stick? And what am I going to remember outside of am I studying for the exam? But really concentrating on that because there's a lot more fulfillment in that. And also thinking about a liberal arts education, that's what you have at your, your disposal. Um, so I would say that, but I think Ben actually raised a really interesting point of getting to know yourself and that matters day one and it matters just in life, but especially in a professional environment where teamwork is so critical, figuring out where and how you can add the most value to your team members. And 
similar to what, to build off of what Nicole said, just because you're getting a degree in econ or accounting or finance or what, whatever it ha is, anthropology, you're not stuck in that space. Like your career is a journey. There's a lot of development that comes along the way. And so the one thing that's served me really well so far in my career that I wish I had started doing earlier is asking for feedback from people that I work with, whether it's a group project or from a professor or somebody in my life that sees me in a different facet, is just asking for feedback and being eager and hungry to improve and build yourself and develop yourself. Um, Cause that's one thing that I think sets people apart and just a willingness and a growth mindset. Wonderful, awesome. I will end my questions for these four. I won't bring up any economics questions to test their knowledge if they can still remember some of their intermediate macro. Um, we won't go there, but I, I do want to open up for students. So do students have any questions that you would like to ask? Please don't be shy. Or do any professors have questions? Uh, I have a question, and this is just for anyone. Um, what tips do you guys have for like work-life balance? And um, when you start to lose motivation or steam with your work, how do you kind of get yourself back in the groove? That. I mean, not honestly, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, so I will say the work-life balance aspect shifts as you move through your working career. Um, when you start at a company, it's not necessarily the um, assumption that you should be working more, um, but realistically, everybody that um, is your manager or on your team, um, they have a lot more going on in their personal life. Um, that you just haven't had enough time to develop, you know, uh, whether it be a family or kids or those kind of things. Um, but I will say the one thing that to be very, very cognizant of is that do, don't burn yourself out early on by doing that. So even though you may feel like you need to, it's okay. And I promise you, it's okay to just take some time for yourself um, early on in your career. Now, what that is, I mean, each person is completely different to how they unwind, right? And that's part of the, I'm not I'm trying not to just always say know yourself, but like, for me, I go and play some golf. That's what I do to unwind. But that might not work for someone else, right? Um, because, it, you know, it's just whatever you, whatever you can do to get your mind and like completely off of work. Good, good advice there. Uh, Agnes, uh, I'm looking at Jocelyn, Nicole, anything to add? Um, I totally agree with Ben, you know, or yeah, Ben, um, when you're applying for jobs, one of the things you'll notice that um, you might be, especially if you have different job offers, one of the things you might be comparing is paid time off PTO. And, you know, when I hit a point where I'm nearing burnout, you know, um, I've certainly had periods at Alaska where I have worked a couple months with maybe 80 hour weeks where it's felt like a crazy busy season, but it's always been temporary. When we acquired Virgin America, it was a really busy time in my life personally and professionally, but I knew it was temporary. I knew it was an amazing growth opportunity. Um, airlines don't buy each other every single day, right? So like I knew it was maybe a once in a lifetime experience. And so I took that opportunity as um, a chance to really show that I can take initiative and work really hard and accomplish something historical for my company. And so during that period, I definitely came close to burnout, but that's where my PTO came in. I then took three, almost three weeks off, which I would never do, but I knew one week would not be enough to get my mind off of things. So going to Ben's point, like I, I, I'm knowing myself, knowing that I'd really need to disconnect for a little extended period of time. That's what it would take to get me to kind of, you know, regain a lot of energy again. Um, but yeah, like I think what I've learned is that um, in most roles, you're going to have periods of slowness where you're like, this is awesome. I'm getting off early a lot of days. And you're going to have times where you're working maybe crazy hours, but almost always that's temporary. And hopefully if you hit those types of times, you'll find it rewarding because you're being really productive um, and hopefully you're enjoying what you're doing. Good. I got a bunch of other questions in here. So Jocelyn, Nicole, do you guys have anything to add? And if not, I will fire the next question to you two. I echo everything that was said. Oh, Nicole just went on. <laughs> Sorry, I was getting a scam call. Um, oh. I agree with everything. Good. So, so then we'll start with uh, Nicole. What was the hardest transition from going to college to the workforce? Um, 
Well, I can start, start with one of the easiest things is not having homework. I really like that piece of it. Um, <laughs> I got my weekends, my nights were just like mine to just enjoy. Um, but the hardest part for me was um, like, you think about when you first go to Gonzaga, you're like a freshman, you're like, oh my God, who are my friends? Like, where do I live? How do I find where I need to go? It's kind of like starting totally fresh. Like you're just a baby in the workforce. Um, but I would say one of the most positive parts of joining the workforce when, and being like just totally fresh to it is that there are a lot of people cheering you on that want you to succeed and are willing to help you up on your journey to figure out, um, you know, where you need to flex and where you could grow more. So, um, other things that were really hard for me was, uh, were also just like figuring out how do I manage my time? um outside of work like I felt like I had all this newfound freedom but at the same time I had a boss who was like hey you really got to consider professional designations you got to consider what are you studying to get to your next step um and so I kind of had to figure out how to ease that into my work and life schedule good Jocelyn the only thing that I would add there is at least with my coursework at Gonzaga, I had classes at a certain schedule and I kind of knew, especially getting into junior, senior year, when I was the most productive and could focus the most in class and when I was going to do my homework. And when you get into the professional realm, you don't have as much flexibility about when your core hours are or should be because you're conting it's contingent and reliable on relying on other people that might not be in the same office when you have overlap. And so that was kind of the most challenging for thing for me is transitioning myself to be really productive during a standard, like, set eight, nine hours, whatever it is in a given day when maybe I was more productive at night before super early in the mornings and just kind of adapting to that. I'd say it was most challenging. Um, good. Okay. So another question that came in, um, I think th I'll tie this one to Ben and, and Amos since we'll just kind of back and forth here. Um, I think Ben, you mentioned and hinted on this, but when you've come out to the lit workforce and you've met other people from other schools, how has the Gonzaga education, the Jesuit education made a difference in your job or in how you've approached your job? Well, I mean, not to parrot the whole line of the school, but it's truly holistic in the way you think about things, right? And so it's, you're not in a class, you know, you, you're not just hammering home economics all day, every day, and you don't learn any of the other, um, you know, whether it be psychology or uh, philosophy or religion or those different um, ways of thinking about things, right? So I think that, I mean, that's one of the, the things, but also um, the, I feel like the community is a lot stronger um, post uh, um, college than a lot of other colleges, uh, as far as just what I've observed from friends that went to other schools. So that part's pretty cool as well. <laughs> Agnes, what about the Gonzaga experience, the mission of Gonzaga that uh, has been different for you or helped you when you've been at Gonzaga? All right, Alaska. Um, I think Ben totally nailed it. Like the holistic experience, it really makes you a well-rounded person. And I think that's part of the reason Gonzaga is respected really highly in the workforce. Um, we've, um, in my seven years at Alaska, we've hired quite a few Gonzaga grads and there is something consistent in the character of each person we've hired. Um, I hate to say it, but it kind of feels like you know what you're getting when you're hiring Gonzaga grad. Um, good, okay, next question I'm trying to, pin down. We have a few more minutes left. I don't want to take everyone's time, um, but I will, if people have questions, they want to follow up with either Agnes, Jocelyn, Nicole, or Ben. I have all their emails. I, I'm happy to connect you with any of these four. I, I'm guessing they're more than willing to share their time uh, and answer questions via email if you do have specific questions for them. Um, so which question can I best sum up here of these three? Um, and feel free to respond to some of these in the chat if you guys see them. Um, if you're not, if, and some of you have mentioned this, right? When you started your job, it wasn't the dream job. So how do you get through that moment where um, you're doing a job and you're not loving it? What advice do you give or how do you persevere and get through that? Because all four of you are with the company you started with. I actually noticed this question in chat and I think it's a really good one. There's two things that I would think about is first and foremost, are you still growing and developing in the role, even though it's not your dream job? Is it still challenging you? And if so, like that's okay. And that's a good thing. It's when you get to a point that you're not still growing 
and it's not challenging and you're not excited that you should definitely should be looking. And probably before that point, when you feel like you can see that on the horizon is when you should start looking and figuring out what's going to excite you. But while you have a role, you should be thinking about what is that next thing that I do want to get to and how can I use my existing role to team me up and build out my resume to get there. So that could be working with your manager for or, or your supervisor for different development opportunities. I want to get this type of project to get build out this type of skill set. Is there anything that I could trade for my workload or take on in addition to get help me get there? Agnes, Ben, Nicole, anything to add to Jocelyn? I think she makes a really good point. And what I would just add is that, um, you know, when I started um, at Alaska, when I, I started, I liked my job the first six months. And then after six months, I kind of felt like I know what I'm doing. I'm a little bit bored. And so I found myself a little bit restless thinking I haven't been here long enough to be looking around for other jobs. I don't have enough experience to probably be considered for other jobs. You know, like it might not look good if I'm leaving at this point. And I found, found it a little bit, um, I don't know, just uh, scary to talk to my manager about it, thinking, is she going to fire me if I say I'm not happy? And then what I realized was that part of her success was defined by my success. And if I wasn't happy and if I wasn't feeling super productive anymore, then, you know, she wasn't feeling like she was doing a good job because she didn't understand um, kind of the situation I was in. And so once I communicated that, she was able to put me on really cool projects and really help kind of stimulate my growth. Um, and from there, when I was promoted into various other positions, it was also a, ref a reflection of her. Um, and so I think for me, one of the biggest kind of learnings has just been that like, it's a, a big cycle. Everybody's kind of trying to help each other. You always do need to be your biggest advocate, but you need to communicate with your leadership because at the end of the day, your company's only going to grow as well as um, everybody else within the company is growing, right? Does anyone else have anything to add? If not, uh, well said. Well said. So I will wrap it up there. We're at 1256. I just want to express my appreciation for Ben, Agnes, Jocelyn, Nicole. Um, I'm grateful you guys are able to join us.